The show is strictly for educational purposes. The opinions expressed on the show are personal to the individuals appearing in the show and not those of Thinking Tree Ecoholics Private Limited. The show is not intended to offend or defame any individual, entity, caste, community, race or religion or to denigrate any institution, person, living or dead. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hello and welcome to Ecoholics Thinking Tree series. Today we have with us very distinguished professor Dr. Surajit Sena. Welcome sir, welcome to our show. Thank you. He is currently a professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He has done his PhD from McMaster University, Canada. Currently, he is teaching macroeconomics, monetary macroeconomics is his major areas. The today's topic is very important and interesting topic, what India needs today. Now you know that Indian economy is struggling with the problem of economic slowdown since 2016. Now this slowdown has worsened due to COVID. So in the same scenario, we will discuss some of the important and core issues of Indian economy. So first question, uh, first my first question to you is, India even before the advent of COVID was struggling with many macroeconomic issues. Which issue do you think has become the most urgent in the face of this pandemic? Thank you, Sanal. Uh, I have listed a few items. There are many things that need to be considered. Uh, number one is public health, two, cure and vaccine for COVID, distribution of food and cash transfers to people without income, and number four is gradual opening of the economy, which is becoming increasingly difficult because they're opening and shutting down and it's happening, yes. happening elsewhere also, just not in India. So these are the really challenging tasks we have immediately. And then later, there will be typical macroeconomic issues and social issues that we have to deal with. Some of them are pending, some of them will be new. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, I was reading a study which was conducted by researchers at the University of Washington Institute of, for Health Metri Metrics and Evaluation. It analyzed population trends in 195 countries. In the mid of 2020s, India is expected to surpass China's workforce population. Though the working age population of India is projected to fall, it will still be the largest working age population in the world by 2100. How do you think government spending should change in the light of this data? This is a very interesting question, but one thing I need to warn you is that the forecasts are often not very correct. Although yes, the trends, trends, trends can be set. So I would talk in, in light of a large population, a large working force in India still in the mid 2020. And if you look into the history of population in these two countries, for instance, China and uh, India, they have very different population policies. From the yes. 1980s, China had a one-child policy. So naturally, you would expect by mid-2020, there would be a lot of Chinese people would be retiring from the labor force. And given that their population growth rate is very small, with that one-child policy, they would have fewer people probably in the labor force. So they would not be, may not have sufficient amount of labor force yes. if the economy keeps on going at the pace they do normally. Whereas in India, we didn't have a one-child policy. The population growth was quite high, about 2%. Presently, yes. it is down below 1%. So what I would expect is that, given a very young population today in 2020, by mid-2020, this century, we would expect that uh, you will have, uh, mid-21st mid, mid uh, century, I would expect that uh, population size will be quite reasonable and the labor force would be quite large. However, uh, uh, whatever be the size by middle of this century, we have to keep in mind that uh, about, say, if I, if I assume that to remain constant, about 65% of the population is in workforce, being, being an Indian, but you would expect that number to change. Yes. And what you can expect is that more people in getting into the retirement age by that time, and Indian population is not that young, with a lower growth rate, than comparison, say, compared to the new entrants into the population, and therefore into the labor force. 
And the second point that I would like to mention is that the technological development, the way it is progressing elsewhere in the world, you might expect that in certain traditional professions and other professions, new, new emerging areas, there will be a replacement of labor with capital. So there yes. will be people out there looking for jobs, which traditionally they may have been doing and expecting, but they may find it difficult to find the job. Therefore, the role of government will be even bigger than what it is today to look after a labor force which will cater to a very large population because the okay. income of the labor force will feed the rest of the population yes. and without not having, not having a very good post-retirement income scheme in India still, like pension fund, etc. Yes. The government may have to do a lot more. So one of the things you might expect, or it would be nice to do, which we often talk about in cities, that the, both the spouses need to work. So you yes. would like to create an environment for women to come in to the labor force, actively participate, so that the double income might help the family quite a bit. Yes. So having these things in mind, what you look into the present policies is that there's a thrust towards skill development since NDA came. This word skill development was not so prominent in, during the UPA era. Yes. And therefore, this is the right move. However, little progress seems to have been made on that front for various reasons. I need not go into that. Yes. So therefore, what you would expect is that uh, the alarming uh, things that we have today need to be completely eliminated. For instance, I did a report recently that 50% of India's labor force has come out of the labor force. It's no longer looking for jobs. Okay. And that might make things easier for the government to manage, but they will have to provide work or employment for 50% of the labor force, estimated yes. labor force, because the 50% has quit. But that may be showing a very dismal sign, a uh, picture of the Indian economy. And the reason why it has happened, what I have found, the reasons are, these are primarily women who have come out of the workforce, which is okay. very bad news. And younger people are going more towards father studies to get a better job. But when there are no jobs, younger people going for higher studies, it has to be really good yes. to get a job and compete there. And also there are a bunch of discouraged people, which is always there in the population, who are no longer part of the labor force. They have quit looking for a job because they remain unemployed for a long time. Hence, I suggest certain things for a short run period, not a long run population policy or to take care of the labor force. Number one, the short term employment income welfare program, which was exists, which has been existing in India since the 1980s, it started in Maharashtra and then has uh, kind of taken over many parts of India and central government has been pursuing it, like Mandrega, need to be created for income in both rural and urban areas. And this point yes. was suggested by a professor from California, which Indian professor, Professor Pranabhardhan. Recently, I heard him talking about it. So Manrega need to be extended to urban areas. Urban, yes. Urban yes. areas, just not rural. Second point is that to increase labor force, women labor force participation, we need to create more enabling infrastructure, like daycare facilities and housing, yes. transport for commuting, credit availability for self-help group and small entrepreneurs, skill development to produce products with confirmed markets. You cannot only depend upon dying industry like a handicapped industry and develop skill there and then look for a market. You, the market has to be judged, prejudged to some extent, so that when they create something with very simple technology, they are being able to sell them or somebody is able to sell them on their behalf. And of course, you need the proper health care, which has been neglected in many countries, just not India, because without good health care facility, I work at IIT, no. if my yes. family is unwell and I don't have access to health care, my work productivity goes down immediately. Seriously. And my household productivity increases, which is not good because yes. household is not paying me, but yes. I have to be working outside, but I cannot because there's a trade off between home and if the health is not well of your family or yourself, then you are really doubt. So that has to be taken care of on yes. a priority basis. Yes. Then you have a very important thing, which we have it in India, but we are not pursuing it very well. We need all kinds of uh, skilled labor around us. And these are not semi-skilled, they are skilled, like electrician or yes. a plumber. You know, they require specific skills. You and me cannot do the job. 
if you, yes. even if we try. So we need skill development of lowly skilled, which I mean is unskilled and semi-skilled labor, primarily male population I'm talking about, with clearly defined employment opportunities. And here, overhauling our ITIs, which exist, and I've been asking people who have gone for a degree or diploma at ITI, is that they are not functioning well, like many okay. of our government, government schools. Mm -hmm. So ITIs can be overhauled and used because that infrastructure already exists. It needs to uh, overhaul it. Yes. And then, then, of course, you need, which is a general statement everybody would make, is that the quality of education beginning with primary till college university level has to improve. If That's the quality true. doesn't improve, no employer will have the confidence to hire anybody. Yes. So the quality has to improve. Like when you hire for your company, Koholik, somebody, or even ask for services, you check definitely uh, the quality is good. You know? Yes. So these are the things. Now, certain measures have been taken. For instance, we have a lot of migrant labor, which is understandable because if you don't find a job in your village, you go to migrate to another village within your state. If you don't find a job within your state, you go to another state, which is very common. And we noticed that when that uh, the lockdown came, that the migrant labor crisis that happened. Now, they have, they have to, you have to have simplified administrative procedures for that and facilities. For instance, one ration card they're thinking about is a very good idea. So yeah. that when you migrate, you carry your ration card and you get the ration from the local ration shop yes. without any hanky-panky. I mean, India has a tendency to throw out people even if they're hungry because you don't have the proper document. That shouldn't be the case. So that means the procedures have to be simplified. And therefore, proper documentation of migrant labor has to take place because you, if you a place where you're migrating to might like to know how many people have come from outside the state yes. in order to provide the ration. Very simple thing. You want to know how many guests are coming before you prepare your dinner. Okay. Seriously. If you don't know, how can you prepare your dinner? I mean, this is yeah. very difficult. Yeah. And then another thing I want to mention, which people don't usually, uh, governments usually shy away, and they do a very uh, uh, shabby uh, uh, job on that, is that you need to identify vulnerable employment areas like seasonal employment and unemployment in rural areas. In rural, in urban areas also you have that. Somebody working in the brick kiln and the brick kiln, you know, the construction industry, the house has been built, he doesn't know what to do. So you usually we ignore those because we don't care. Essentially we don't care about them, but we need to care about them. I mean, we cannot be treating them as any animal, you know, stray animal in the street. So safety net for vulnerable employment where labor can lose their jobs unexpectedly and people are primarily dependent upon seasonal employment. So the safety net has to be created to be in great. terms of alternative jobs, in terms of transporting them home, giving them some income, subsistence income maybe to survive, etc. So these are the big broad mm -hmm. issues in yes. response to uh, since Global Gender Gap Index, very famous index published by World Economic Forum, measures gender equality across four pillars. They are economic opportunity, political empowerment, educational attainment, and health and survival. Globally, the largest ge gender disparity as per the 2020 report is in the political segment. However, among the 153 countries studied in that report, India is the only country where the economic gender gap is larger than the political gender gap. What are your views on this, sir? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it sounds very uh, kind of striking to you that uh, political gender uh, disparity is less in India than economic disparity. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I will tell you why. The reason is that, as you have said, that uh, the worldwide political disparity is very high. Yes. So if you act well there, it doesn't mean you are doing well, number one. True. If you are at IIT, you are a rank holder, it means something as opposed to a local engineering college, unrecognized, and what kind of a position you have. I mean, I've been to various types of schools, for instance. In one school, I was getting a rank. Another school I entered, I was nowhere in the rank. I mean, I was probably at the bottom. Not was, I found myself. I mean, so it depends upon, it's a relative it yes. depends upon in with respect to what you're comparing. But I tell you something, gender disparity is so bad that I was looking into these numbers. This is a wonderful study, looking into the numbers. The places which are doing well, the disparities ha have minimized to about 5%, 4%, oh. 7%. Now, attendment-wise, in women disparity, in, in women gender uh, political disparity, 
only 25% has been attended of parliamentary districts have remained. And only 21.2% of ministerial positions have remained. So I don't think there is much of a 25. It has to come to 50% to have an equality. So a way behind oh, an yeah. average in the world. So despite in, this has happened, despite increased number of women in senior roles, you must have seen that uh, in companies, private companies, women are occupying important roles. In IS, if you look at the results every year, you see at the top position, even women are there. All right. So what is happening is that the percentage share of women is still very low. So despite having a number of women in senior roles and their participation, however, their participation has stalled also. In India, as I told you, 50% of the labor force is out present. Women yes. have come out primarily. So their financial disparities are therefore increasing. And as financial disparities increase, it's like a vicious circle. You cannot let women to go out work because she also has household work. Yes. And then they are not finding job. It's very discouraging. If you're a migrant labor, you can be thrown out any time. We don't know how to reach home. We have children. They may be even dying on the streets. Now, all this creates an atmosphere where women cannot participate. All right. But despite that, I found a very interesting reason for worldwide, which might interest your uh, listeners, is that they are citing, the report is citing three reasons for that, for lower participation of women. Women have greater representation in roles where automation of production processes is becoming commonplace. Fantastic. Okay. So in Western countries, for instance, yes. women have a traditionally higher role in Scandinavian countries, you know, even the prime minister of the country is a woman. Yes. You know, very few countries are there, but they are there. We also had a female prime minister that was way back, which is unthinkable, yes. which no other country had, that except Sri Lanka, probably. Yes. Being a third world country, we had those things. But that is a rare event. That is not a common event. So, what is happening? Oh. Automation is removing women. They are easy to get rid of for some reason, I guess, than male. There's a tendency. Then not enough women are entering where the growth rate of wage is high. So okay. women are not getting a proper share of the pie they are creating. That also discourages them. So they are not entering places where the, the salary hike or the salary level is high. Okay. It is primarily dominated by male. And then, you, of course, you have that point I mentioned, insufficient care facilities and access to capital. Yes, true. Which is always true. Self-help groups have a problem, but we at least have these concepts alive in India. I mean, after all these years, 70 years, we have these concepts alive. alive. They may not be taken care of. They, I mean, there are countries in the world there where there is not a single woman in the parliament. So, there are many countries there. Yes. Okay. okay, so therefore, what I'm trying to say is that uh, one or two of these reasons, some of these reasons may not be true of India. India is doing well on this front. However, the fact remains that women in India are still preferred for the traditional unpaid roles at home. When a mother gets his son, uh, son is working away from home, so mother gets his son married, often the uh, thinking that I've noticed is that now this will be the local guardian, the would be Bahu, will take care of my son. So if you have this attitude, See, As opposed to now, who will contribute to the income, then they, they, I don't know if it is good or bad. I'm not ethically judging them. What I'm saying is that this attitude would immediately set a routine, a template for what women can do there after they get yes. And they may be doing the same thing before they got married, helping he, her own mother. Yes. So you don't have the tradition. What you have is an attitude where the traditional roles are preferred and therefore less opportunity for good education is given. Ah, Thora to school bhej diya, class 5, 6 tak ho gaya. You know, 8 tak kar liya, bahut hai. I mean, you don't have an attitude for a girl to become equally educated like a boy. Seriously. Because the earning member you assume is going to be the boy, not the girl. And these are the things that come in, against it. And also they are not encouraged for career even if they are educated. I have instances where women very well educated, in fact brighter than the boys in the family. But they were never encouraged for career building. Can you True. imagine? I mean, this is yes. if we're talking about 21st century. 21st century. Or the end of 20th century. And compare that with the developed countries. Yes. So we are far behind that. So all this contribute to not only the political disparity. These are all contributing to the economic disparity. disparity. So the other three factors that you mentioned, educational, health, etc., that you said, 
are all country and political contributing to the income economic disparity as well. Remember, True. they're feeding into it. Yes. It's like each other, a simultaneous equation model. All right. So now coming to your question of political disparity is less in India. India has a tradition of some women in political and social level leadership over centuries, I tell you. You take okay. the case of uh, Savitri Bhai Phule. Yes. A lower class woman who was who used to carry two saris to her school to teach because one sari will get dirty by the things that will be thrown at her on her way from home to the school. You okay. will find that literature on the internet if you find it. Reliable source. So this is how, so it's the jeev, it's the, it's the determination or the willingness of one lady to change things yes. has not been uncommon. So if there are some women who wants political positions, wants to go to parliament, I'm not surprised in India. The culture has yes. been there. But the culture of mass, culture of the mass is not that. It's yes. different from the individual preferences you have. And that's very rare. So therefore what happens is that the tradition continues despite chronic underdevelopment and all that. You will find one lady, one girl in your neighborhood, one girl in a family doing something completely different, thinking mm -hmm. differently. And he's looked upon as a rebel, maybe, in the society. True. All right. So in other words, we are used to women assuming political leadership or occupying teaching position. Teaching position is very common. It has been accepted. Yes. Maybe because of lady like Savitri Bhai Pune, that we accept women in teaching in position. Teaching All right. And yeah. uh, we had Mrs. Gandhi also in India. She yes. was the first woman prime minister who, as I told you, there were hardly any women prime ministers or head of state. In the Seriously. So therefore, you should remember, um, Sana, the thing is that it's not the question of economic disparity at 149 position out of 153 countries or political disparity at 18 position out of 153 country and therefore we are doing political empowerment better. It's not that at all. It's a relative ranking. What is worrisome here is as you have pointed out is that the 149 position out of 153 in 2019 in terms of economic disparity is a really disturbing number. Disturbing. Yes. That's what worried me. Yes. Okay. Moving towards uh, the next question, sir. The Reserve Bank of India has released India's balance of payment data for the January-March quarter of 2019-20 financial year. India has managed a current account surplus, which is around 0.1% of GDP. This improvement in trade balance has been driven mainly by a sharper decline in imports. This is a warning sign for the economy as the declining in imports points out towards the contraction in the demand in the real economy. What, according to you, is the way out of this? It's, an, yeah, it's a question that has uh, got your at, uh, attention, I understand. It's a normally do. Normally, you know how people react to this. I mean, when I was a, uh, a college student, there was a surplus in 1970s after the oil price hike from dollar nine to dollar twenty seven. Yes. And imagine that oil price shock at least had 100 articles pouring in into various economic journals what it would do to the economy. The forecasting yes. models, there are articles as to how basic equations need to change in macro model because oil is such an important input. Now, but despite that, imagine after this, uh, this shock, India had a trade surplus. So there are factors sometimes which are very short term, which can create yes. trade surplus. Your worry is, is it a bad news or a good news? And your, your, your implication here is that that it is probably a bad news because we are imports are down. Well, it's undoubtedly that is true because if you look into the history of the last five, six years, particularly after demonetization, we have traded off the gains we got from the previous 10, 15 years yes. with this demonetization policy, we damaged economy. So naturally, yes. economy hasn't taken off again, didn't register a high growth, and investment is not picking up. Demand is low and consumers have less confidence. We may not believe in Keynesian economics, but we know that consumer spending is a very important part. Investment is a very important part of the economy is doing. So they have been down. So therefore, maybe uh, in this century, I, did, I was not keeping track of macro data. It's quite possible that they were going down farther. And if you cut back on oil, etc., which are large imports in terms of the bill, Right, yes. Mon monetary share in import bill. Well, you can have a trade surplus because often exports 
are it's true of other countries also exports are on a contract basis you yes. have a contract of of supplying certain things certain amount to an importer abroad and with covid i i recall there are uh, stories coming out of these garment factories in bangladesh etc as to where they depend a lot on the garment factory textile industry is that these uh, foreign buyers are finally at the last one can not being able to export so whatever be the reason what is important to me in this respect is the following is that number one whether this trade surplus is persisting or not then we need to look at it otherwise ignore yes. it yes. one year one quarter trade surplus is not an import we had one year trade surplus imagine in the 70s after oil by shock nobody bothered about it except naive students like me looking ah india was doing so well god knows i still don't know why it was doing well people thought but we had a trade surplus imagine True. how we looked at numbers those days Acha, keeping aside the effects of pandemic or trade, what is important in the medium run is to develop more exportable goods and services, revive manufacturing in India, cut back on imports which can be produced at home, both consumer and capital goods. We are often buying substandard products from countries like China, etc. You've got to stop. I found that out about 15, 20 years back when I was buying toys for my kids. Indian toys were slightly higher in price. But much better quality than all these Chinese products that were coming, and we opened the door blindfolded. You know, we had no, we were not we had been keeping an eye on what was coming in. It's unbelievable. But move away from petroleum product usage for various reasons: environment and import bill and all that. Make the economy more sustainable yes. and encourage more domestic R and D. To this is very important. Encourage domestic R and D. I'm not talking about only government labs. I'm not talking about only company R&D. Overall, the R&D environment has to be, including academic institutions, yes. to create substitute technologies which are frequently required in India, but are often patented by other countries and multinational. This is a problem. With pharmaceutical products, you know, Novartis would charge 150 rupees for a drug, which when Indian companies can produce a generic drug, what happens is its price comes down to 50 rupees. Seriously. So we need that. We can do that, in fact. And then we have demonstrated that in the pharmaceutical sector, generic drugs are not only helping Indians. At the same time, they're bringing in export revenue. Many African countries buy drugs from us. Seriously. Even presently, what happened during pandemic? Uh, President Trump kind of ordered our no. prime minister to supply some bulk of drugs because they are they know they keep you know they are well informed that India does yeah. a good. Uh, amount of output and quality output in the pharmaceutical sector. Yes, and true. It's cheap, cheap also. So we need to do more that with respect to other things. For instance, the other day I bought a router for my computer. It's not a great router. The first one Chinese made didn't function well. I had to return. Fortunately, it was Amazon. And then I had to buy another one, more expensive, thousand rupees more. I hope today I will be able to complete my interview with you, this conversation before it breaks yeah. down. You know, it can break down after that. I won't mind. So I don't <laughs> trust them. What I'm saying, you know, it can go any time. All right. Yes. So if this kind of a strategy initially requires, even I also want to point out, advanced products or technologies to be important. This is the way we send people to get better training from a yes. better institute, skill institute, you know, provides better skill and education abroad, and bring them back home, which Japan did after Second World War a lot. And what I mean is that you can even import some products, advanced products, technologies to find out what they're doing, and yes. to expand forex with forex, you know, foreign exchange reserves on it is not a bad thing to do in the short run. Even if you're spending it and your import bill goes up, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yes. So it depends upon why your import bill is going up and what you can do with the exports. Together, a strategy has to be worked out. And I would like to point out soon that uh, here. Our prime minister's Akman, you've heard, which has become a slogan. You know, this this government goes with slogans, <laughs> has uh, become a slogan. Is actually, I'm going to point out in my last point today that you probably have to going to ask me. All right. Okay. Uh, so, do you think that government <laughs> schemes aimed at bettering the life of Indian masses often fail because they are backed by populist agenda and not backed by through thorough survey or study of Indian behavior? 
Well, this is often a criticism of go all governments in India. I've seen, maybe true also of other countries, is that popular schemes are often announced before elections, and often they are even abandoned when a party comes to power. They will talk about how much income tax which has been stolen from you, or how much money stolen from your country will come back to, you, and your bank accounts will flood with that money. You know, they have these schemes to get the votes. They are they always abundant, they are unachievable. So you have to make a realistic judgment on what popular schemes we're talking about, or not even popular, which are needy schemes. So what I've found over the years, if I watch government carefully, I may be wrong. I mean, I can be wrong on many of these points that I've mentioned. There will be some other people who will point out something else. Is that there are three things that matter here. One is the political ideology, whether a right wing or a left wing government determines the set of priorities and policies going to have. I've seen that happening. So political ideology, number one. Then the vision of the political party in power. What do they want to achieve in the next five year, ten year period? Initially, maybe five year period. Once they get re-elected, they might think in a country like India, where you can have unlimited term for a government, can go into a, uh, you know, uh, or even a prime minister, not a government, but a prime minister, you can go into even 10 year planning after that, after the initial five years. So the decision making process is of a select group of experts. Government doesn't do it alone. They will hire you if you think they think you are an expert in health. Yes. They will hire me if they think I'm an expert in something. So finally, the project is drawn, the blueprint, and it is implemented by experts and administrative officials. So where things go wrong, I will tell you. Betterment of Indian lives require not only relevant projects, it also requires effective implementation. Yes, true. So often projects have failed to achieve the desired goals not because sufficient funds were unavailable or the blueprint of the projects were defective, but what was lacking was political and bureaucratic will to implement them and widespread corruption also. Corruption does play a role. Yes. Because if the money capital is eaten away, in to unproductive things than what is meant for in a poor country like India, where you don't have unlimited funds. Uh, how would you complete a project? So consider, I have an example here. I don't know whether it will make sense to your listeners. I've been watching this stress in Indian agriculture for a while, which every Indian does well. Now, what UPA did was very interesting. UPA government, those two terms, they were often announced loan waivers. I mean, I remember. Dr. Chidambaram will come and announce big loan waivers, 50,000 crore waived. All right. So what they're trying to do, this a policy, which is popular, is going to take the stress away. But is it really solving the issue? Okay. This is my issue, my basic question. I yes. mean, if you solve uh, the issue that you yes. want to address, then popular or unpopular, the job is done. The job is done. Okay. So UP often announced loan waivers for farmers, coupled with seasonal short-term employment programs and the one regular and minimum support by the MSP or certain products. This was the strategy brought this case. Yes. What I found is that the ND under BJP leadership is very reluctant to grant loan waivers because they think the loan waivers will work across the board so the both the rich and the poor farmers benefit and therefore the end result is never achieved of relieving the really the needy ones. Now, what they have done in this right, is the two things. They have not been very encouraging coming forth, I think, with respect to MSP. After a lot of hanky panky running after them, they would raise the MSP a little bit. So the MSP is a minimum support price, which has to follow a formula. And even with that formula, there is controversy with the formula. So not because our that green revolution father of India's stock was a Sridhi uh, Basan. Swaminathan. Professor Swaminathan had a formula, people would say, ah, what a lovely formula, but they won't use it. So I haven't really understood what goes on in the government as to the decision making process. Maybe that formula is too expensive for government to manage. So mm -hmm. they want to do a wishy-washy job, they will show you and the farmer, ah, we are giving you so much, but actually it doesn't benefit the poor farmers. The rich farmers are doing all right because the size, the scale effect gives them enough income. The next point is that they are doing a very interesting, they are doing a commercialization of agriculture by trying to build agro-based products, which they think will serve the Indian market as well as being exported. Now that, that takes time. And you can imagine if the farmers are not giving a proper remuneration for the supply of the raw material, then the farmers are not benefiting. There are some corporate companies who are selling the final product and are in touch with the consumers in the export market are going to benefit. 
the farmers yes. are not. So the, the gap between what farmers receive and why government tries to give them an MSP will persist. So what I'm finding is that neither under UP nor NDA have been able to resolve the marginal small farmers continue to live in distress. Farmer suicides have not reduced. Hence, any popular projects in agriculture have continued to fail in India. The answer lies basically both in the ideology and pressure of the political party and incapability of the selected group of experts who frame the agriculture policies and also those who implement such policies. It's not helping. So this is what I want to say. It looks popular if you give apparently that MSV made an income. Are wonderful. We are all happy. Or, or, you know, something they're giving me, but it's not really solving the crisis, it's not helping the problem. So there's some problem. So therefore, I would like to conclude, I do not think politicians or administrators or think tanks like, you know, that uh, plan, they have replaced the planning Nithi government Ayo. with the IO people are unaware of it. They have good access to micro level service because a couple of times they've heard how much micro studies they do, which you were wondering whether they have done enough survey of the preferences what they want and also they have a broad idea about the sectoral trends in you know aggregate semi-aggregate variables but it's the problem lies somewhere else yes true so we already see the world being divided into two groups also globalization has done much harm in the face of this pandemic do you think that the world is gearing up for another cold war or is this just a pretext of deglobalization? Yeah. Because the Second World War was the turning point, and the closing of the war also was the turning point, just not the beginning, closing of the war. Closing of the war. So what we have seen since World War II, that there are many political groups, international political groups. For instance, the Western Bloc of countries, USA, never adopted by them, you know, France, Germany. Then you have the Soviet bloc of countries you had. Yes. So you not only had uh, Soviet Russia, Ukraine, etc., all under it, but also you had Czechoslovakia, Hungary, etc., Poland, all you know, side, siding with Soviet, the communist bloc. And you have the Commonwealth countries are very less hostile to each other, but you had Commonwealth games, we still have. And the non-aligned movement of Jawaharlal Nehru and Tito and Nasser of Egypt mm -hmm. and, you know, Tito of Yugoslavia and that Malaysia, yeah, mm -hmm. no, you know, you had these groups were getting the developing countries together. Some were developed, yeah. but mostly developing countries. So you mm -hmm. have all these political groups and you wonder why these political groups. Is that just politically they fight? No. It has implication for your economic solution. Yes. When you form a group, it may not be a formal trade agreement like Pacific Trade Agreement or something, or NAFTA in mm. North uh, American Trade Agreement, Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, USA, and Canada. But they do have implications for trade, economic cooperation, and all sorts of things, and of course, military and other things. Yes. This is all. So now what happens is that these economic interventions got disturbed, but in a healthy way it got disturbed, we thought at is that when the Soviet bloc was dismantled, they realized the communism is not working. They want to go for capitalism in the market, at least. The political mm. control of communist authority, as in China, they want to go the economic path with an capital market. All right. They saw realignments. What happened was, politically, they started realigning some of them with the Western bloc. So some, like prisoners, got loose from the Soviet bloc, ran to the Western bloc and say, help me, help me, please help mm. me out. I want to be part of you, and later I want to be part of European Union. All right, this has happened also, but sure. some prefer to stay with the Soviet bloc, like Cuba. Yes, with the Soviet bloc. So what has happened is that this realignment took place in the late 80s. China started opening up before the realignment in the early 80s under that famous uh, Prime Minister Xiao. Uh, what is it? Deng Xiaoping. Deng, Deng. Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, Deng Xiao. Yeah, yeah. Under him, what has happened is that while it started taking place, and the you know the new liberal policies of Reagan in US and Margaret Thatcher in England, the world economy was turning slowly towards another direction. 
And then what came is what is called what we call globalization or market capitalism based on trade theory, etc. And then that overtook these all the basic behavioral pattern of these countries. Even yes. and what I found is that all of a sudden Western countries who were in a cold war with the U.S. and with with uh, say U.S. in cold war with Russia and China, McDonald's very eager to open a shop in China. McDonald's very eager to shop, open a shop. They opened the first shop, the first restaurant in Moscow. I mean, it's unbelievable what how it turns around. So all of a sudden, Western countries became very interested in opening markets for their products across the world. And of course, third world country, India, it came in the. It's so Coca Cola was here, but the bulk of it started coming in this century. I think. Yes. But they started coming in Bangalore and places, selected cities, and then the foreign companies started coming in. But what has happened now with about 20, 30 years of globalization, privatization? If you say in India, since Dr. Manmohan Singh was the finance minister early 90s, and uh, previous Narasimha Rao was the prime minister, this market capitalism globalization seems to have benefited some countries, and that too some sections of the population within countries. It is not very fair. <coughs> with respect to who, who gets the benefit, it's benefit. Trade yes. is benefiting. So poverty, unequal income distribution, adverse trade balance, and so on have become quite prominent across countries, rich and poor, both the countries. The USA, if you take into the poverty index, you take into income inequality index, if you go to the numbers, you will be surprised to see what picture you have. The pandemic has simply brought out the glaring shortcomings of globalization and new liberal economics. Also, yes, where role of government has to be cut to the point now they cannot deal with the public health issues in most of these countries. Cuba has dealt with it better. Imagine a poor country because they were not following new liberal policies of globalization. Yes. In some ways, Cuba was fortunate that the USA didn't go and invade its land. It yes. was on its own and whatever he thought is good. Cuba sends doctors because they're Italian immigrants to Cuba. Their forefathers came from there. Yes. And look at England sending doctors to the USA. They cannot manage their own problem. The first world I'm talking about. I'm not talking about India. Yes. But India is getting influenced by that new liberal policy a lot. So in the post-COVID world, I expect a reset of economies. Economies, the way economies function. If you are a stupid country, you may not reset it, and you still believe the way we were doing before. I will keep on studying like that, whatever grade. Or I want to change my attitude, and I would like to get a better grade. That's a difference. So, if the political order in the world will change, and it has started happening also, and let me tell you a few quick points, and then probably it will be all right. Nation states opting for more for their own resources for their well-being will happen. Not foreign trade, not multinationals, and how much they can help me, which was this globalization thing that was going on. True. So, Atmanirbhar is a prominent example of this. Actually, a very early indication we have in India is Atmanirbhar. What it is, it is not as import substitution only. It is self-sufficiency in a way. But spoken in Sanskrit. What it is saying basically is that you try to get your things done without depending much on other people or your neighbor. Yes. So nation states may adopt more protectionist policies across the board. It may happen to protect their trade balance and vulnerable industries at home from foreign competition. So it will be a reverse to protectionism to some extent. Yes. But globalization has left a mark where that mark cannot be erased. He does. Yes. Something will flow through those paths. Still, what I'm saying is that in addition to that, there will be a tendency to protect yourself from pandemic, from economic calamities. A market shock in U.S. It didn't invade India. For instance, yes. the 2008 collapse of these uh, what they were the bank and yes. all that happened. Why did it? Because the globalization at that time in the financial market wasn't that much, and India wasn't depending upon so much on Western capital, whatever the way economy was functioning. If it had, we had felt a larger shock. So when I looked into the call market data, which is a very high frequency data, every day call market rate varies, 
and you will find maybe in my money and banking lecture, but I looked at it even about five, six years back. There was one spike yes. and then it came down and became normal. Call market would register that immediately because that's the most sensitive market in terms of its reaction to anything yes. happening in the money market, the financial market. True. Because there's a day-to-day -day borrowing going on. Yes. Okay. okay, so I have checked that and this is my general feeling. It didn't affect much in India. It did the US, of course. It did yes. many European countries because they're more you know, connected, interconnected. Yes. Globalization is the interconnectedness. It so how much do you want to be interconnected, basically? Do you want your cooking to be determined simultaneously with your neighbor's cooking? Or you want to have a freedom in what you eat and the neighbor let him eat, although we meet once in a while. So there's a limit to how much cooperation can help. Yes. Basically. How much trade gains can be there from trading. There's a limit to it. And yes. the U.S. is paying a price every day. China. Every day you hear Trump shouting at China. You yes. know, when I open my TV, every day President Trump is shouting at China. It is China's fault. It is the Chinese disease. You know, we won't fund the WHO. Yes. So public, the second point is that I want to warn the consequences of certain other globalization and things. Is the public health and education, things like that, who took a back seat, basically. And the funding cuts for U.S. universities I've been hearing from for many years, which I didn't hear when I was a college student. It started happening after that. So government doesn't want to give them much money. So public health, etc., due to new world policies, new liberal policies of many countries, may return as a priority agenda in many countries. As soon as you have labor shortage in the country, you will see universities getting better funded because the foreign students are going to not only do a research, but once they like your country, they will settle down and that human capital you need for your industry. Yes. Even China may do that. I'm saying it may not. It may do that. Actually. True. So countries may take environmental issues more seriously than before. Recently, Bill Gates warned of a much greater pain due to climate change that is coming than the pandemic in the years to come. Yes. Incidentally, he also predicted a pandemic a few years back. You must have seen the TED talk. The TED talk Bill Gates gave. You must have, you must see that. He clearly yes. warning. If youth leadership keeps on following this Trumpian path, what Trump does, withdraw from this, withdraw from that. We may see less of U.S. leadership in the world, which was primarily the leadership, a very competitive leadership, wants to overtake Russia all the time. Yes. So we, that the Chinese, they may try to do. Yes. A recent example of this is his withdrawal of funding of WHO. So it's not participating in WHO, it is announcing at least. Yes. Then withdrawal, as a dangerous thing that may happen, is the withdrawal from INF. INF is that Reagan-Gorbachev treaty which is the okay. Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was signed by USA and Russia, may encourage this. Is, USA has withdrawn it, withdraw, has withdrawn from it. And okay. Russia is saying, no, no, we were following it. And US is complaining, no, you were violating the norms. Basically, US wants to rewrite it. This is a Trump strategy. He wants to rewrite the nuclear deal with Iran. Yes. So, and it was its predecessor who formed these treaties. So he's rejecting the Republican as well as the Democrat, whoever had treaties. I don't know what's going on there. So withdrawal from INF may encourage resurgence of nuclear arms race between the older blocs. Suddenly, the nuclear arms race, again, they begin. Thousands of nuclear arms were dismantled. You won't believe me after that. Not the SALT Treaty in the 70s yes. and the 60s. It didn't happen. Yes. It was on paper only. But the real effective treaty was this INF. Okay. I was actually, I, I looked up again, and I was making a mistake initially when I was thinking salt. No, salt didn't help much. It was a gesture. Yes, okay. Okay, to control our nuclear arms production. So there may be a silent resurgence of nuclear arms race. Also, policies like withdrawal from Iran nuclear deal by USA may encourage non-nuclear countries like Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Because what happens when you have a deal, you give Iran feel better and it can develop its economy, maybe the regime benefits, then their, their, their incentive to produce nuclear arms is not so much there. As long as they will feel threatened, and they're such True. a proud nation because they have a cultural history, not US, a couple of hundred years old. Iran and countries have, yes. 
and that pride will exist. So what will that? They will go for nuclear as a defensive mechanism. Hopefully they don't use it. And then the rest of the world, like these first world countries, become allergic to it. So it's not working. It's just a very unwise policy. I think. All right. And then I want to mention another thing. Trading, this has started happening in US dollar as a using US dollar as a key currency, which yes. gives the US so much power actually in the world, economic yes. power, is going to diminish. Because China and Russia is already trying to figure out how to bypass dollar and trade. Maybe using ruble, maybe using yen, I don't know, maybe using gold. Gold standard may come back. Who knows? Yes. True. So now this one, along with the misuse state policy of sanctions, which they often do. I don't like Iran. Trump withdraws, puts more sanctions. Personally. There are hawks like that in US. There are hawks like that in everywhere, every country. But if you give them privilege, if you give them a kind, of, a kind of a prominence and importance, they would invariably, they cannot think beyond that closed boundary. You have to come <laughs> out of that boundary and think, okay, how is it affecting that country if I do this? Yes. Oh, if I do this, not because I'm a powerful man in the neighborhood, I can do whatever, but if I think how it affects, then the relationship and the overall welfare improves much more. True. So what is happening, they would withdraw from the key currency, and these countries where you use sanctions so often and destroy a country like Iran, Syria, etc., whatever you do, that will become, which are unfriendly, considered unfriendly or non-aligned with the U.S. political thinking, then what you do, they would try to move away from dollar as well. I mean, why would they trade in dollar? They would have, a, you know, India and Russia had a rupee trade. So yes. India would uh, uh, buy something and pay rupee to you, Soviet Russia. And Soviet Russia will keep the rupee and buy something from India later. It's true. It's a rupee trade. No dollar was coming. No pounds. Yes. No key currency. So you can have by party, you know, uh, a kind of... Uh, you know, you have uh, two meant. countries, two countries, not multilateral trade, unilateral trade with yes. a country on the basis of a currency. Because okay. I buy goods from you, you buy goods from me, why don't we use our currency? Okay. And finally, I would like to mention that the political role of China and Russia, China doesn't show much political role in the world, except yes. vetoing in the Security Council. Doesn't. Russia yes. shows a lot of political role. You know, it's now also has a military role, very active in Syria and Libya and all those places. Russia is very different. But China mm. may become Russia tomorrow and may start exerting much more because of the failure of the U.S. to either convince the rest of the world and also taking off these participations. Participation. will isolate and give more prominence to Russia and China because you can expect, of course, that uh, China is going to be a power to reckon with. Economic someone power. has to it's fill. Someone has to fill that vacuum. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it has to happen. It's a, yes. like a law of physics, you know. It's not an economics or a political. Yeah. It's like a law of physics is bound to happen. Bound to happen. Yes, true. Love Paris Agreement is one of the best example in environment. The U.S. withdraw yeah. that. Yeah. Exactly. If you withdraw from environment, I mean, he, scientific evidence is denied. Why is it denied? Because for political reasons, yes. if you play so much of politics, there's a trade-off. And at the cost of science, then you're going to pay. In fact, U.S. infection rates are like competing with India today. India has the highest infection rate now. And U.S. is competing with India still. India started later yes. infection, three months late. Three months look late. at the data, current data. So it's not doing well. <coughs> Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful session with you. And uh, it was really very informative. At last, sir, I would seek a few encouragement words for our initiative, Ecoholics. Look, I, uh, to be honest with you, Shanath, I never heard of Ecoholics. So I opened up the website. I was very impressed. I mean, the website, the way you have designed it and the services you are providing is unthinkable. I haven't heard of, you know, with modern technology, internet, probably these are possible. I mean, I heard of people preparing for their education or jobs, etc running around getting a you know, question paper from the past exams or something, preparing on the basis of this. Whereas we have organized help, starting from school students, plus 12, to IS aspirant. This is, this is enormous. I mean, who doesn't need, particularly the culture has become, you need a tutor's help. 
true. With JE and stuff, the culture yeah. has been built now, which is sad because at an early age in school you shouldn't be sending your children to a tutor or tutorial home. But the culture has become that you take help. I remember IIT Kanpur students would go and stay in Delhi after their undergraduate degrees when they're preparing for their IS exam, where certain institutions have uh, uh, not only providing study material, training them, but also they're living like a student again in hostels. So mm -hmm. Delhi has a culture being the yes. head office of India, you know, where you give and appear for interviews and for IS, etc. That is like a school college education. You go and, you know, you have residential course kind of a thing, though near, not their hostel probably. There are hostels, private hostels, PG what you call, yes. available in the city. You live there like any undergraduate or postgraduate student and what you do, you get training to, so I'm very happy you are doing and your enthusiasm is unbelievable. I mean, when do you get time? I mean, is this your whole full-time profession? Yes. Or you do other things too? No, sir. This is my full time. I take ah. guest lecture all oh. over the country. Okay. Guest lecture also. Yes, okay. yes. This is quite a bit of work. Mm -hmm. So I wish you all the best. And I hope to see uh, here from on your website from students who have been, uh, who have benefited from your services, what they are saying. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Because that will really encourage other ones. Yes. And from your... Uh, marketing point of view, that's not a bad thing either. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful session with you. Pleasure talking to you. And because I admire uh, you as my teacher, when I also saw your videos of IIT Kanpur, so it was very, very informative for the students. I also shared with them to get more knowledge on monetary macroeconomics. So again, thank you so much, sir. You're welcome, Pranod. It was lovely interacting with you, particularly when I'm locked down in my home. In the weekend, there are lockdowns in UP now. Yes. You cannot come out. So I'm very happy that I did it with you. It was a very nice morning I had. Thank I you, thank sir. you too. Thank yeah. you too for Have taking a nice day.